Hello, and welcome to Creepy Core and Folklore, the show about creatures, encounters, old tales, and myths. I'm your host, Iona Wayland, a dark fantasy author, mental health professional, and overall curious person. I want to join other spooky souls and hear about these unusual stories. Hello, spooky soul, and welcome to back to another episode of Creepy Core and Folklore. Um, this is episode 33, which is pretty exciting. I feel like a 3-3 three, three is a good number. And if you listen to my Lucky 13 episode, you can learn about what the number three means in like angel numbers or whatever, which is pretty cool. But it's really exciting because I have an excuse to talk about one of my favorite things ever. I'm so intrigued by this. T- today, or this week, I should say, is the 51st anniversary of the Iditarod race. Um, this is an intense sled dog race that happens annually uh, in Alaska. And I'll get more into um, more about it in a second. But just like behind my thought process behind it is it's a past special interest for me. Like I still find it very interesting, but back in the day, like elementary school days, I would consume so much information about the Iditarod race. Um, Not all of it was factually accurate. So it was funny because whenever I was doing, um, looking into more background information about the Iditarod, I was like, oh yeah, because it's for this or that. Or I was, I was, kind of using my old elementary school knowledge about it, what I'd been taught and what I'd read about it. And it turns out that there was a lot of misunderstanding that I had on my end. So it was really neat to not only dive back into an old special interest, but do so with like an adult perspective where I can like really critically think about the information I'm being given and not base it off of a child's show. (laughs) Um, But I'll get into that. Um, The thing that I liked the most about it (laughs) was uh, the show Balto, the movie Balto. Um, You may already know what I'm talking about. There was this kid's show Balto that really got me into it where it was talking about like um, delivering, uh, there was like a sled dog and there was like half wolf dog. And it was like this whole thing about how they were like delivering medicine to children in Alaska that needed it. But it's interesting how the wires got crossed about what's the Iditarod and what's uh, a different race called the Serum Run Race. But I'll get into that in a second. It was actually interesting because uh, I named a farm dog after one of the um, like childhood books I liked reading called Akiak. And I named my, uh, well, it wasn't really mine. It was like one of the farm dogs where I worked, but they let me name her. And I named her Akiak after that sled dog Akiak. <laughs> I was very committed. This year um, of 2023, the um, 51st annual race is actually going to start on March 4th. And then it lasts as long as the mushers or the the human counterpart of the sled dog racing team are racing. So I just wanted to like commemorate it with a creepy core and folklore episode. So here's some background. It's sometimes called the, quote, last great race on Earth, end quote. Um, It takes place during March, like I was talking about. Um, It takes place during March. And the mushers or the the humans that are in charge of the sled dog team and ensuring their own safety and the dog's safety uh, travel by sled, led by sled dogs. And it's a sled dog team that takes them from Anchorage to Nome, Alaska. It's almost a thousand miles in length. Uh, they travel over mountains, icy tundras, through villages, over ice and snow. It's really interesting because this particular trail was originally used by indigenous Alaskans. Uh, It was used as like hunting, traveling, um, trapping, and like the specific path to get from village to village. In 1910, it was a really heavily used path um, for the gold rush. There were villages along the way uh, of Ruby, Ophir, Flat, Nome, and Elam. And there's even, even Iditarod is one of the villages along the the coast there. Um, But now all these towns and villages where people would swarm to for um, 
trading the gold rush uh just tourist attraction they are all ghost towns but when they were in their heyday supplies mail uh, all those packages were delivered via sled dog team that was one of the only ways at the time to deliver goods in that way so joe reddington senior actually used dog teams um, in his daily life um, and he wanted to preserve the trail in the sled dog way of life and that way he named the Iditarod Trail and it is now recognized as a National Historic Trail. And this is, um, as I'm sure you already imagined, the Iditarod Trail sled dog race. That's what's used today. Um, there's this misconception that I originally thought. So I thought it was related to the celebration and recognition of the diphtheria antitoxin delivery to Nome in 1925 because both of those like you know the Iditarod ends in Nome and then that's where that's who needed the diphtheria vaccine um and that's what was depicted in the movie Balto and it's based on that well I found out later before doing this research that the sled dog team that actually did most of the work to deliver the diphtheria antitoxins was led by Togo, the dog. Um, but during the last little stretch, they had to trade off to a different mush musher team, and it was led by the dog, Balto. I still think it's amazing um, that Balto is so recognized and commemorated today because no matter what part of the trail that dog team is running, it's still treacherous to say the least. So I just wanted to throw that out there so that Togo doesn't go unnoticed as well. There's actually a different race that specifically commemorates the antitoxin delivery. Um, and it's called the Serum Run, which Joe also helped establish. But it's completely different than I, the Iditarod. So what happens is that there's one musher with 12 to 16 dogs total that they can utilize on, on their sled dog team with at least six dogs that cross the finish line. And that means that they are hooked up to the sled and uh, it means they're hooked up to the sled and they're the ones taking the musher across the line, the, the musher and sled across the finish line. There must be six at that point. Anybody who is convicted of animal cruelty or neglect is immediately disqualified from being a musher. The musher and their dog team are required to take three mandatory breaks. I think it should be more, but whatever. Um, and the top 30 mushers will win a cash prize. There are checkpoints all along the way with vets that are trained in sled dog um, background and understand the race and the working dog uh what the working dog needs to be in order or needs to have in order to be healthy um they can also at these checkpoints switch out dogs um unhook dogs officially so that they are taken to safety all these different different things that they can do rest there's extra food like supplies things like that at these checkpoints i'm going to include the link as related to the risks for the sled dogs in the description, um, there were different things that happened that were somewhat neglectful along the way um, for this particular race that things have changed since then, but there's also ways to advocate for um, the health of the sled dog team and ways to assist um, kind of like the downside of the Iditarod race and some of the shady things that can happen as well. So I have that linked below if you are interested in looking up that kind of thing and wanting to learn more about it. But ultimately, the health and safety of the dogs and the mushers are of the utmost utmost importance. And then winning the race is, of course, the goal or being in the top 30 or even just finishing. Um, I don't know why I said it like just finishing as if that's not super freaking hard. Um, but but of course, those are the goals. But really, they need to keep the health and well-being of human and dog at the centermost point of these things, because ultimately it's a competition. It's not it doesn't need to be a life or death situation, even though it is a very treacherous trip. So this started in 1967 
and these mushers and their incredible dogs traveled quote jagged mountain ranges frozen river dense forest desolate tundra and miles of windswept coast temperatures for far below zero winds that can cause a complete loss of visibility the hazards of overflow long hours of darkness and treacherous climbs and side hills and still mushers set off on this adventure each year into the quote vast uninhabited alaskan wilderness end quote So now you can see why I'm almost certain, (laughs) this is where it all ties in, that the trail is haunted. (laughs) It's perilous. It's old. And there's so much history. Like, it's got to be haunted. Um, And it's really interesting because there have been lots of lore behind. um, Oh, see, I'm already getting goosebumps, for God's sake. I haven't even gotten into it. I'm about to talk about haunts. And I'm already getting goosebumps about it. But um, there are many mushers that will discuss seeing other mushers dressed in old clothing. Some hear cheers along the trail as they race, but there's no humans there. And then those ghost towns were once vibrant during the gold rush um, and by native communities before the gold rush. Sometimes there's still like echoes of who lived there. So let's get into some of these very common haunt telling and ghost tellings. So there's this tale of the old women on the trail between Kaltog and Unalakleet. I have tried to look up the different um, ways to pronounce these villages, but I keep finding different <laughs> like commentators and how they pronounce it and like I can't find the true form so bear with me if I'm not saying them correctly which I highly suspect I am and then also feel free to correct me if you know the correct way of saying these things but this particular chunk of the trail and that this mountain around them is called quote old woman end quote so there are many different versions of this quote old woman um and yes, the this part of the trail and this particular mountain are named that, but there are stories behind why it became that way. So one version is that there was a woman that died in an avalanche. Um, another was that there was a woman who was cursed because she was like hunting and trapping and that's not a job for the woman. And so she got um, cursed. Um, there was another story where she was a trapper that would hunt and trap with her husband and she died by avalanche and that the husband was so heartbroken he couldn't leave her where she was buried and so he died of um, exposure there as well. Um, but what we do know is even to this day, there's a decrepit cabin you're not supposed to use. Um, people will warn the mushers not to use it. Other mushers will warn each other not to go near it, not to even look at it. Um, and there are some really chilling tales from different mushers and their experiences being around that section or going into the cabin itself. Um, there are many mushers that when they are in view of the cabin, they will feel grabbed or poked and some dogs refuse to move when they are close to the cabin. Like these are these highly trained, like, I don't know if anyone, I don't know if you've been around a, a trained working dog, um, but they are like these incredible, absolutely fascinating and strong canines like they they have a job they're trained to do they freaking love it they were made for this job like they were bred and made for this job specifically it is in their dna it is in their blood to work and for i don't even my own dogs that are not built well (laughs) i have some crazy looking creatures uh of dogs (laughs) i have to say out of my four uh two of them look a little wild um in like a you're not made correctly kind of way (laughs) like there's even one dog uh, Artie (laughs) um he's a chihuahua yorkie he came from like a a hoarding inbreeding situation he was I I got him through the rescue but his original story came from that and he's I always say that he looks like bad taxidermy (laughs) um or that he looks like a sentient wig (laughs) I don't 
I love him so much. And I and he he's very cute in his own specific way. But if you think about how cute Chihuahuas can be and how cute Yorkies can be, you'd think it would look like a super cute dog. But Artie is a little bit uh, funky looking, which makes me love him even more. But even when he this little creature decides not to if he doesn't trust somebody or if or if he's frozen and staring at something I I still get my hackles raised like what's going on why aren't you moving or why aren't you trusting this person so for these highly skilled highly trained bred for this type of thing super healthy mushing dogs to freeze and not move is absolutely chilling to me there have been mushers that have gone inside and said that um, they have heard singing or felt like they were in a trance. And some leave offerings to appease this, quote, old woman, whoever she is. One musher said, quote, she is a time suck. You just want to rest for a bit, but you stay longer. She definitely can wreck the strategy of a race. I'll go by there and tell myself, don't look, don't look, don't look. Can't stop here. Can't stop here. Can't stop here. She kind of hums. First, you think the humming is the wind coming through the boards, but it's a tune, soothing, but also kind of haunting with minor notes rather than melodious notes, end quote. Um, And this particular musher has reported what she's seen several times um, in different reports. And that exact quote was used in a bunch of the um, resources that I have included. So it was very interesting to hear her account of things. There's another spirit that's been consistently reported, uh, apparently of a man who was suspected of dying in an avalanche. Um, And he helps those in need along the trail because it's very easy to get lost on the trail. Like, it's like, okay, there's a trail, but like, I mean, we're talking about being covered in snow or mud or ice or um, in these like, white out situations like how how are you supposed to see that and then I remember from the Akiak book <laughs> that sometimes when there are local people that use snowmobiles to get around you're like okay but like are these I'm following other sled dog trails but like is that a sled dog trail or is that like a snowmobile trail I don't know like it's hard to tell the difference apparently um so it's very interesting that like there is apparently this spirit that's like, no, 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 go this way. Or like, yep, you're on the right track. Like he'll help those who need need that along the trail. There's also a spirit close to the ghost town of Iditarod itself, which I thought was really interesting. And so there is this another from that that veteran mush, musher, D.D. John Rowe, um, who had another quote about what she saw. She goes on to say... When I came here in the early years, I was certain I saw other teams, but they were all old teams wrapped in blankets and wolfskins. All of those people are there, and you can see and hear and smell the wood smoke. The ghost town clattered with the noise of fire pokes and slamming doors as miners milled around, their arms heavy with gold weights and scales. They weren't happy to see you. They would just give you looks like they were hoarding their stuff. You wanted to get away from them. And it was really interesting to hear this telling um, because for a while, like there's, you know, there's snow blindness. Also, when you're solitary for that long, because the trip can last, I think the shortest or one of the shortest ones was actually, let me look that up. I think it was like 10 days or something. Let me see. Okay, I just did a quick Google search and it says the fastest Iditarod is noted as Mitch Seavey in 2017 when he finished in eight days, three hours, 40 minutes and 13 seconds. Um, That race was run along a Fairbanks to Nome route. Okay, so okay, at the, the tiniest, the shortest amount of time, it would be more than a week. Like you're exposed to so much, so many elements and lack of sleep. And like, there's a lot going on, um, potentially health issues. Like there's a lot happening. Um, So she was kind of like, okay, well maybe I saw in other interviews that I'll make sure I include that she's like, well, maybe I was like kind of like hallucinating, (laughs) you know, like a normal person. Um, But she was like, when I could smell it though, like that was, that was weird. 
like that was wild to me that she could smell and that she and that they like interacted with her but kept away from her and they were like kind of glaring at her as she went through so I think it's really interesting that Dee Dee definitely sounds like she's like mm, like a sensitive or something I would guess or that she can she happens to see things but also she's not the only musher to see it um there there have been mushers where like it's multiple of them in a clump that have seen similar things um there will be sightings from different mushers saying that they see grain silos along the Yukon River. Um, there are also other spirits uh, that are reported that can shift into wolves and bears, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, my special episode 29 instead of 30 this time, uh, a woo werewolf. <laughs> so dumb. I, I howl in it. So if you haven't listened to it, And you're gonna, I'm sorry, but also not sorry. It's who I am on the inside. Um, But the the special werewolf episode, I talk about shapeshifters and like where that might come from. And there's like lots of different, um, I wonder if I should do one on like were bears. I didn't really like get into it that much Um, when it came to other were creatures. um, I didn't get a whole lot into it, but like the whole shifting into wares and or wares (laughs) into bears and wolves is a thing that, um, has been a part of like indigenous tellings, but also like spiritual tellings. Like there, there's, it's very symbolic and it's seen in other places. So I can totally see um, that being a theme from reports. Um, there's also like a, a particular spirit that wakes up sleeping mushers so that they don't die of hypothermia, um, which I'm just like, what is happening? <laughs> like, the type of human that decides to take on this race is something else that's for sure they're built different (laughs) they're built different um there are also these medicine spirits reportedly that are you're told not to look at or acknowledge or engage with um but someone who's had many experiences um it, it they said that there was this one part where the spirit kept like following them and they felt really really upset by it and their dogs were reacting to it near Kachatog and they yelled quote I'm just racing I'm not bothering you end quote and the menacing figure disappeared um and I'm just so excited to hear about another ghost yeller (laughs) instead of a ghost whisperer um because uh I don't know uh if you had a chance if you want to sign up for my um if you want to sign up for my newsletter you totally can um and I include like a free bonus episode (laughs) about my haunted house that Uh, I sold last year um, and different things that me and mostly my husband, which I'm a little bit jealous about, had experiences with. Um, But I talk about how I'm a ghost yeller and I just like yelled at this ghost whenever I got scared, Um, you know, like a professional. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm not a professional ghost hunter or anything. I'm such a scaredy cat. I could never. Um, But I like hearing about other people's experiences with that kind of thing. But it's just funny that this particular musher like... (laughs) <laughs> it's it, I don't know I just love it. it's like I'm not bothering you it's like I love I love that <laughs> that was the response um and it's it's interesting too that the same response it's around that Kachatog area where the dog's hair will stand on end and mushers will report seeing the same thing sometimes multiple mushers at the same time will see that negative entity there so you know there's a lot to take in there's there's many different ghost stories I think there was one I didn't see this anywhere so maybe this is just a wives tale or just like a rumor but I swear I remember reading something about how there's this particular leg of the trail that goes through um a a village that's now a ghost town like there's no one there anymore but there's um this feeling of another musher behind you that's like studying you and on the sled with you and guiding you through that particular part I don't know if I'm making that up um I don't know if that's me being sentimental um I thought for sure I remembered reading something about that that feeling of having that uh, an entity behind you so I think that it's it's really interesting of all the different possibilities that could be there. I'm very uh, confused about the grain silo thing. Like, was that was that ever a thing? Like, why are people seeing that? Or is it like a combined hallucination? Like, are people hallucinating? Is it a trick of like um, like a mirage? Um, is it is it madness? You know, 
uh, or is there something really out there? So you tell me what you think. Um, I would love to know if you know any other information about the Serum Run race, which I think is very cool. The Iditarod race, if you live in Alaska or have been to Alaska, man, I really want to visit Alaska. It looks so freaking gorgeous there. And there's so much like beautiful, gorgeous, and tragic also uh, history that I don't want to gloss that over. Um, and it's just like, it, it's just such an interesting place. Um, and there's been so much happening there. So thank you for letting me kind of dip back into an old uh, interest of mine that I still find absolutely fascinating today. Whatever's out there, I wish the dog teams and their mushers a safe and clear journey. Godspeed. Thanks to all you spooky souls out there for listening to Creepy Core and Folklore. Follow on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok if you're looking for more uncanny content. If you have your own tales to tell, you can email creepycoreandfolklore at gmail.com. If you liked this, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts, or tell a friend who might enjoy these stories to spread the word. If you're interested in dark fantasy, check out my Hollowverse series. Ashes is available now in paperback and ebook on Amazon and audiobook on Audible. And the sequel is underway. I'm Iona Wayland, and I'll see you next time.